Good morning, Asia Pacific Japan. I am Dave Russell. This is my esteemed colleague, Jason Buffington. We are absolutely thrilled to be joining you in Asia Pacific Japan in your time zone live because so many of you for now literally a year, Jason, in Asia Pacific have been joining us in our time zone. So we thought, what's the least that we could do? which is join live, take questions live, take comments live, mm-hmm. actually have people say where they're tuning in from in the comments section so we can actually see that live. And not the least of which reasons why, Jason, is because we have some a very exciting, literally best ever in industry research <laughs> to share with people. Take that and run with that. Set that stage, please. Yeah, and and I just want to echo what Dave said. You know, thank you so much for all those in APJ that have been joining us rather late in your evenings and early in your mornings for the last year. So we wanted to try to have a couple times where we would actually come and join you during your day. Um, And as Dave mentioned, so some of the data that we've been sharing um, has been from the data protection report for 2021. We believe it's the largest single uh, industry research project ever done around data protection. We surveyed 3,000 unbiased IT enterprise uh, or decision makers um, in 28 countries around the world. Um, I did a blog post, gosh, two weeks ago now. And in the blog post, I talked about, do you actually need 3,000 respondents to a survey? And the answer is no, you don't. You don't need 3,000 responses that the only thing you're gonna do is a chart for a PowerPoint if you're trying to prove on your data sheet that you're right or whatever you want to do. You don't need 3,000, right? The reason we did 3,000 is because we cut it by 28 different countries. What we're going to cover today, we're going to cover um, the the APJ region as a whole. So 700 of our 3,000 respondents um, were from region. So we're going to talk about that. But after the call, and we'll send you the link after this is over, um, we have specific cuts of this data for Australia, New Zealand. We have specific cuts for China, for Japan, for India, for Singapore. I mean, there are the ASEAN countries as a whole. I mean, there's, there's lots of different cuts. That's why you do 3,000. So you can cut it a bunch of different ways. Super excited to share the APJ uh, cut with folks today. Yeah, excellent. And, you know, Jason, we've been doing this actually literally just over one year. This is episode, I believe, 46. I have to like bring in extra fingers there, but I believe this is episode 46 of our LinkedIn Live Industry Insight live streams. Without further ado, let's hit our first graphic. And I'm going to toss it right back to you, Jason, because this is something that's been near and dear to your heart for many years. You call it the reality gap. What does that mean? Unpack reality gap for us. And Jason's actually gone through the trouble of making sure we're actually presenting of that 3,000 that he mentioned, the specifics to the Asia Pacific region. Yeah, so the reality gap in general is for the 31 years that I've been in IT and data protection, there's almost always been a gap between what the business expects and what IT can actually deliver. And so this asks two basic questions. Uh, Imagine taking the business leaders, putting them in one room and asking those folks, if IT were to go down, because IT breaks, it does. If IT goes down, how long before business process starts to suffer? And then go to another conference room and ask the IT people, when the systems go down, how long does it really take to get up and running again? What this data shows, actually the first, the top chart of this is the gap between what does the business expect in uptime and what can IT actually deliver? And if you look at the green, we have 33% of the APJ respondents said they strongly agree there's a gap. 49% agree there's a gap. So uh, quick math, 82%, a little over four out of five organizations. By the way, I will tell you that is slightly higher 
um, than it is in the rest of the world. So when we look at the global data, it's in the high 70s, I think. Um, we broke 82% um, in the APJ region, which basically tells us that as important as system availability is worldwide, APJ respondents are even more um, uh, um, uh, sensitive to downtime than the global population. So more of a dependency around IT. Uh, the second stat on the bottom, go to the first group and ask them how much data can you afford to lose? And then go to the IT folks next door and say, how often do we protect our data? And that one's actually a real simple question, right? Because if, if, the, if the business folks say we can only lose a couple hours of data and the IT team says we back up every night, right? You have a gap. Right. And in fact, in this case um, uh, of the eight, uh, of the 700 APJ respondents, we've got 77 percent, again, slightly higher than um, than what the global average is. So what that tells us is that um, in the APJ reason, there is even a higher level of sensitivity and requirement of dependency to IT, even than the rest of the world where those stats were already um, pretty alarming overall. Uh, and again, I would just encourage folks, uh, talk to your Veeam representatives, go to the Veeam local websites. You can get this data and, and start this conversation with your business owners and with your IT administrators, and you can have your data for uh, ANZ, for China, for Japan, for India. Go get your versions of this data and then compare that um, with, your own, with your own company insights. Yeah, and I'd love to put a finer point on that, Jason, because, you know, in the past, meaning pre-ransomware cyber threat, I oftentimes referred to backup and recovery as it was, if you state this in a bit of a negative context, it is a juxtaposition of how much data are you willing to lose? How much time are you willing to wait to get a copy of data back? That's right. How much manpower, human effort are you willing to throw into this equation? And how much money are you willing to pay for the privilege of getting an older copy of data to get back up and running again? And the human response, the rhetorical response is, of course, I want to minimize all of those things. Sure. But unfortunately, along comes things like ransomware, which could take the attack surface or the restore percentage of data up dramatically. And with that, I think that might be a great way to tee up our next slide, causes of outages. Yeah, so in this case, uh, what you're looking at is there's actually three bands. So um, in the dark green band, this is um, uh, when any of the 668, so not everyone answered this question from APJ of the 700 respondents, so a little less than that, um, uh, flag what responses, what outage causes they had over, over the year. You can check as many as you might have had. Um, in the uh, bright green, which is what it's actually sorted by, is what was the most impactful um, outage in the APJ region. And then just for fun, we also put that little bit gray line in between. That is the most impactful globally. And I do think it's interesting that while for the most part, most impactful in APJ, and most impactful worldwide line up, but there are a couple really interesting differences. Most notably, infrastructure scores a little bit higher. Application outage actually scores a lot higher in APJ than it does um, in rest of world. It actually kind of skews the gap a little bit. So, uh, and then the rest of this kind of falls out from there. But Dave, you and I have looked at causes of outages in one organization or another for, for years upon years. What are your thoughts on this? Well. You know, the first thing that strikes me, Jason, even if you don't look at the specific text on the left-hand side, I just look at the the green bars, meaning the ones that are most pronounced and are going over all the way to the right-hand side. And I just say, if people could choose all the things that occurred, oh my goodness, there's so many different things. So many different, it's not like, you know, whatever, the Jason and Dave company could say, we're just going to make sure we get networking right. We're just going to make sure we focus on application availability. No, actually, there are a myriad of challenges today that still take down servers. And I find this fascinating because you and I are both software people, right? But we hear of infrastructure. We hear of improved mean time to failure. We hear of improved redundancy, you know, 
redundant power supplies, redundant yep. fans. Sure. You know, the list goes on and on. However, server outages, network outages, configuration issues, application, operating system, I mean, this whole list goes on and on. So the first reaction I have is a lot of things still happen even today that can take down a server. Oh, yeah. Number two that's kind of surprising to me is the scary concern, of course, is the external notion of cybersecurity ransomware. However, that's actually a little lower on the list, which is not to say it's not important. It's just to say there are uh, so many things that can actually cause an outage. This is why backup remains essential. Yeah, let's bring the chart back up again in full screen because I want to make sure that folks get a chance to uh, hopefully make a screenshot of this because I think this is really, really important. The dark green lines means that 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 um, of the 668 respondents, let's take cybersecurity as an example. It's the second uh, in the list uh, in stacking as far as most impactful. 54% of the organizations in this survey, all enterprises greater than 1,000 employees, 54% of those organizations said they had a cyber event. Mm. Half. Right. So so every time you see the news and you're thinking, well, it's one out of six, one out of eight, it won't happen to me. If you flip a coin, literally, you are more than you are more than likely going to have cyber. Fifty four percent, fifty seven percent had an infrastructure problem. Fifty eight percent had an application issue. Fifty eight percent had a hardware issue. Right. This this is not a matter of if. This absolutely is a matter of when. In fact, the only scenarios that were le that were really markedly less than 58 percent, I'll take the high 40s and round them up. The only one on that whole list that happened less than half of organizations was intentional admin deletion. Mm. Every other scenario was 50 percent or better almost across the board. So just understand, uh, and then beyond that, then um, certainly recognizing infrastructure network uh, connectivity. That's interesting, that's number one, um, because when, when you have an infrastructure networking issue, the whole site goes away, right? You're not talking about a couple servers, you're talking about the whole site is just disconnected from the rest of the world. When cyber happens, right, that's why we see it, is because it is most expensive, it is most impactful, but, Huge, hugely in, uh, insightful data on this one um, and specific to what's going on in APJ. Yeah, yeah, great point. And let's move to what I consider to be our money slide. I hope that's not just a Western term, an American term, but meaning like what is the most impactful sort of killer, amazing takeaway? This would be it. And so, you know, we both love this, but I will just chime on one thing. And I, Jason, I want to toss it over to you, you know, and let you chime in. But, you know, we've got actually an exhaustive list. We just gave you the top few here. But what is amazing is when we ask a fairly simple question, which is, what would drive you to change your primary backup solution? You could choose all of the things. And we asked you to choose the single most impactful thing that would make you change your backup and recovery software. And you can see that uh, in terms of global average, and Jason was so kind to put this in terms of HPJ specific. And what we see actually shockingly to me, Jason, and shockingly is, I mean, I almost can't, you know, say that strongly enough. The top reason is to improve the backup success rate, the reliability of backups. And you and I have been in this industry for a long time, there's an old joke, a bad joke perhaps, that says it's very difficult to restore <laughs> that which you have not backed up. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is almost heartbreaking that mm. after, you know, each of us have 31 years by coincidence in this space. 31 years, right? In in greater than three decades. I didn't have children when I started backing stuff up. Three decades later. Backup for many organizations is still broken, right? One out of eight organizations says their number one reason to change is they want it to work, right? They want reliability along that way. Now, there is, uh, uh, as Dave mentioned, there's a lot more reasons. There's actually about 15 to 18 different reasons that are out there. Um, 
Again, what you're looking at is when you can choose all the things that are important to you, that's in the dark green. Uh, in fact, the number one most important dark green thing, what was the, the, the most common driver is to work better, to improve mm -hmm. RPO, RTO, which by the way, that means RPO is the fancy way of saying how much data can I lose, right? RTO is the fancy way of saying how quickly can I recover? And we saw that on slide one, right? We saw that many organizations believe that they can't recover fast enough. They believe that they are gonna lose too much data when they do get back up and running. And so it doesn't surprise me that that is the number one overall most common. But I do think it's interesting that, uh, that reliability is still top of mind in APJ and um, overall. There were actually a couple interesting spikes that I, I thought were notable. Um, interestingly enough, that as important as reliability is over uh, worldwide, it's even more than that statistically um, in APJ. Uh, I thought it was interesting that moving from on-prem backup solutions to cloud-based backup solutions actually was number two overall in most important. Uh, that doesn't make the top six or seven um, in the Americas, uh, North America and South America, and I, I, I haven't looked at what the uh, what the EMEA cut on that is, but but that was notably higher. I also thought it was really interesting that in APJ, um, being uh, using diversified tools for backup and using purpose built backup tools for different workloads was had a higher interest in APJ than it does in rest of the world. But that makes sense to me because remember the last slide talked about application outages actually being very impactful. Well, if application outages are being impactful, then what you're gonna want is purpose-built tools that understand the difference between a best of breed for Office 365 that's gonna look different than a best of breed for virtualization or a best of breed for SAP or Oracle. By the way, Beam happens to have all of those. Um, as, a, as a little plug. Um, I'm gonna do another plug though, and um, this will probably hopefully blow up our LinkedIn. As Dave mentioned, um, these slides are brand new. They have never been published anywhere else. They have not been seen anywhere else. And the complete list of this has not been published anywhere. If you make a comment on the LinkedIn live stream as far as where you're from, I will send you the unfiltered, not published anywhere else, APJ list wow. of what's driving change in backup. It's not Seriously. available anywhere else, but that'll be fun. So please feel free to tell us where you're uh, where you're signing in from today. That'll be uh, interesting to look at. And I'm going to go to bed after this, and I will be sending those out tomorrow. So wow, seriously, awesome offer, Jason. You know that's pretty killer. And you know, I mean, this is literally the industry's largest ever data protection survey. And you're saying you're throwing down the hammer, if you will, that you're going to send out to anyone that comments. Yep. What are the specific? Okay. All right. I love it. And so I encourage everyone, give us a little shout out, put in the LinkedIn live chat and you know me in the comment section. Just where tell us you're where tuning you're from. in from. Any questions also you you may want to ask. So awesome. I love that. Um, you know, what I want to do next is let's take this up slightly just a, a tiny touch. And let's just talk about digital transformation and what's been going on. You know, as it relates to current events, meaning the pandemic, which is almost inescapable, unfortunately, but we all hope that we're nearing the uh, favorable corner of coming out of that. And Jason, the reason I'd like to touch on this, meaning digital transformation is not something that every backup administrator always feels that they're akin to or everyone that's responsible if like if you're the director of infrastructure etc may feel like that is my domain however we all have a role to play in digital transformation just like we all have a role to play in security and this slide i thought was particularly fascinating not surprisingly the number one response is what if anything was preventing you from moving forward with your digital transformation initiative was the pandemic. However, you know, Jason, I, I like to really look at what I will call, I mean, it's almost a three-way tie for number one, right? Sure. One percentage point is, is separating all three responses. Technically, it's a two-way tie for number two. However, we've seen year after year concerns about staffing and skills. Yep. We've seen concerns about dependency on 
legacy technologies. I will use the phrase technical debt. And it's manifesting itself again in digital transformation. And the reason I like to highlight this is I had a colleague that I used to work with when I was an industry analyst, and I will steal his thunder. I'll name his name. His name is Stan Zappos. But he had a great phrase. And the phrase was, don't be wedded to past decisions, which was a way of saying what was perfectly reasonable and appropriate to do some time ago may not be the best way going forward. And that's exactly how I describe an organization's approach to digital transformation. Your thoughts? Yeah. So the the first thing that came to mind when I saw this. So again, what you're looking at here is the uh, is the the bright the the veen green, if you will, the the true green is the is the 453 um, IT executives at this point um, that were surveyed on digital transformation from the APJ. Um, that compares with the yellowish green, which uh, came from uh, the global survey, 1800 IT execs. Uh, and then also those were both from the 2020 survey, um, very late in the year, right, uh, finishing in January of 21. Um, we did the same survey a year prior. Um, and so that is the uh, that is that darkest green, which is the global data from 2020, which you should equate as pre-COVID um, in the darkest green. So what you're looking at is from dark green to is pre-COVID to the yellow green, which is worldwide, and then looking at um, APJ in particular. The thing that I thought was really interesting is, and I I love what um, what your friend quoted because what that when you look at what most industry analysts will tell you, they'll say that organizations tend to spend between 68 and 82 percent. So split the difference, call it about 75 percent of their budget and of their manpower maintaining the status quo. And that doesn't give you a lot of room um, to work with on modernizing the rest of your environment. Now mm -hmm. take a look at the APJ data because um, uh, certainly in APJ, that dark green, even more focused on the pandemic and overall yeah. slightly higher, but, but those next two down, I think tell a really condemning story. And that is, is that if you're in an outsourcing model, if you're in a model where you have really been locked down and trying to make that hardware last just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer, what we see is, look at the dark greens, 40% um, uh, dependency on legacy systems went up to 51% overall, went up to 55% in the um, uh, in APJ. Lack of IT skills. So let's try to get those people to work just a little bit longer. Their skills were outdated globally 44% of the time. Um, that goes up to 49% worldwide after COVID, goes up to 55% in APJ. So what that tells me is organizationally, as, as folks are keeping data longer and as they have locked down in quarantine, those skill, the skill gap is exacerbated even more in APJ than it is in rest of the world. And there's already a problem rest of the world. Right. Yeah. And if you're struggling with skills and you're struggling with legacy gear, you're not going to be able to move forward, which means you can't do the stuff the business wants because you're too That's busy right. maintaining the stuff that the business has. That's the problem. Yeah. That That is exactly right. In my opinion, Jason, you know, and the problem is you don't want to have that headwind that prevents you from moving forward faster. So, you know, we've talked about some of the challenges Let's transition to, I'll call it the rescue, right? Yes. What does modern look like as it relates to what people think globally, but more importantly in Asia Pacific Japan, what does modern or a innovative solution look like as defined by people in region? And what I love about this is it's multi-factor as you might imagine. However, there are some interesting trends here and I'll toss it back to you to dissect. Yeah, as always, um, the dark green means that um, uh, you could choose more than one. And yep. so in APJ of the 700 um, IT decision makers um, uh, in region, the most common answer, what does modern look like? It looks like DRAS. It looks mm. like disaster recovery as a service by, uh, for 40% of organizations. Uh, but what I think is super interesting is overall in APJ, it's actually a four-way tie for a second. Um, and that's the 36 percenters that you see on there, which is the ability to move workloads from one cloud to another, 
right? That, by the way, that score is higher in APJ than it does in the rest of the world, which I think sh shows their interest in um, a fluidness or flexibility of a multi-cloud strategy. I'm really excited about that and what that means for the for the APJ market. Um, also at 36% tied for second place was the ability to automate tasks and to manage um, from, uh, from an API or from a management framework. And that's interesting because we know that large parts of the APJ IT market are often outsourced. And so if you are using an outsourcing model and someone is managing that infrastructure for you, having backup be taken care of as part of that other broader framework absolutely makes sense for the APJ market. Um, Similarly, right behind that, also 36%, the ability to do uh, orchestration and workflows. Again, trying mm -hmm. to get out of those manual tasks, trying to orchestrate and repeat things so that you have better consistency. Uh, and then lastly, and I think this speaks to the 36% as well, the ability to standardize between on-prem policies and IaaS and SaaS policies, and that and that rings true. That's a tie with the with the top one, which was that organizations in APJ are saying they want to be able to leverage a multi-cloud, they want to be able to leverage a hybrid cloud architecture, and they want policies that are consistent between how you protect on-prem and how you protect in Amazon and in Azure and in Google, and they'd like to do that with a management framework. That's what APJ. Um, answers for that. That's the overall response. And then to see that um, agility between clouds and disaster recovery using a cloud are the top two answers, again, just talks to the progressive pro-cloud nature of, of the APJ region. Yeah, very well said. And you know, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you, uh, obviously, for everyone that's tuned in, everyone that's tuned in to all of our live streams, but Stella, Jake, and I got to make sure I get Leo in there too, Hey, thank you so much. Australia is Australia here. screen. Yes. Yep. We got Singapore. We've got Australia. You know, tuning in live right now. Obviously, if you tune in later, by the way, give a shout out or give a comment, meaning in this LinkedIn chat. Still, even if you view this sometime after the initial viewing, we greatly appreciate your participation. This is a little fun thing that we like to do, a little technology that we've got. Looking ahead, what we've got are a couple of exciting things. Now, on Monday, we're going to bring in a special guest, Andrew Zalesko from our Veeam product strategy team. So he awesome. has been, I'll call him a cloud dog, I meaning like he is all over. He is a little, little, he's a pit bull basically on all things cloud. He and I are going to riff on. You know, we talk a lot about cloud, you and me, Jason, and it's not just one thing. I love your phrase, Jason. The cloud is not a single thing. So we're going to decompose a little bit uh, about what Veeam can do in that capacity. We've got, prior to that, though, this Friday, our great friends, David Hill, and also uh, we've got Sam. I'm sorry, I said David. You know, David Hill is correct. And then we've yeah. also got Sam Nichols discussing cloud yet again in a different context around AWS specific protection. But Jason, tell us a little bit about Veeam On. This is a pretty major industry analyst event that we put on year after year. Yeah, so this is our worldwide user conference. And and while there are many things that have been inconvenient um, about, uh, about uh, the global pandemic, one of the things that we started doing last year was it did give us a chance to really open up the Veeamon catalog uh, and user experience to a truly worldwide experience. And so we've got a couple days. It's uh, May 25th and 26th, or 26th or 27th, depending on uh, which hemisphere that you are in. But these are deep dive, hard hitting, um, 300 and 200 level uh, sessions from all the major experts. Dave, I see your name on the list. Our friend Rick Vanover's there. Our boss Danny's on the list. Anton, yep. um, a longtime spokesperson for Veeam. So it's going to be just a fantastic two days of sharing ideas, of giving and getting feedback, of bonding with other uh, Veemers. Um, it's going to be a great, great two days. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, everyone for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in for literally the last year plus in the Asia Pacific region. We hope to get out there and visit you sometime soon in person. Stay safe, stay positive, and we'll see you on the next live stream. Thank you. Take care.